Are they poussins? The five string looked away from the bottle of wine, priced at 1,000 bits retail. They had been sent before her to accompany her late lunch. Yes, I thought, she said, turning to look at her ward. The Pegasus Wendigo hybrid was smiling at Poussin's with pure adoration. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great, was the immediate enthusiastic response. I saw tensely he was going to flap his wings and jump up and down, but seemed to catch himself and just smiled violently at Frey's ring. I've had an amazing day. I slam with steam dreams, and she made a wire sculpture of a scarf to chase me around. And then I went to the cult jacuzzi you made for me, and it was really fun. It was like I was inside a whirlpool. His wings began to spread as excitement took over took him. And then I played with those walking, dancing toys you gave me, and I chased them all over the ship and... When the ice hearts wings opened a fresh and more, bracing the invisible line that no well-fed brawl out of the house of the upper just glow would ever breach the public. Poussins held up a hoof and flipped her wings by the slightest amount. Ice are immediately blessed, and even the ice portions of his body, taking out slightly red as his He snapped his wings taut. This is a wonderful ship, he said with a more controlled voice. Thank you for letting me write, Auntie Poussins. Of course, dear. Poussins waved a hoof around the dining room, which had more silver and platinum and the walls of furnaces and some mines. I had it especially commissioned. It's the fastest airship in Ecclesia, and the most exterior still. I thought oh, I could take, hardly take you and your friends anywhere in a secondary airship. I started to part to Poussin's table, and Poussin nodded slightly as he waved for the servant, an old camel who once worked for an Equa prince. The Palau's chair declined onto it without flapping his wings like a silly commoner. How's your airship so fast, Auntie? he asked. Does it really have big engines? No. Poussin slipped out a wing at the northern end of the room. It does the magic. The front of the ship has many spells that thin air in front of it, and the back of the ship has spells that thicken the air. So the ship is pressed forwards by the different uh, pressure. It's much more efficient than a bag of gas and a pilot tonight. Iceheart remained silent to her explanation, listening intensely and not even visiting. Poussons again cheered. He she couldn't help but compare it to perfectly being an Iceheart, a commoner full with no new blood that she knew of, to her own family, who constantly resisted her guidance. It seemed every other week she had to stop one of them from embarking on a short sighted career, or marrying a pony that wasn't right for them or trying to take some of her power before they were ready for it. And yet, they struggled against her at every turn, even when she was obviously right. Put down the good eye! Put down the good eye! Even Scepter, her great-grand cult, a foyer associating with friends that Poussons had selected for him with such great care, preferring to run around with undignified muslin foals from a public school. It was nice sometimes to see her volt ponies, especially Iceheart, be treated with the respect she deserved. I'm a gonna kill her! And respect, of course, deserved respect by kind. By the way, I thought, it's your snack time, isn't it? You must be starving. What would you like for lunch? A big ball of ice cream, was Iceheart's immediate response. And a big ball of cereal with some cold milk. Poussons turned to the camel servant. One last bowl of premium honey to rusted oats, she ordered, with the same formality that she had displayed when ordering exquisite caviar three nights prior. With a large glass of top grow, great triple A milk, with two scoops of top cow, vanilla ice cream, and a separate bowl. The servant bowed and left without comment. Poussons turned back to Iceheart, smiling tenderly at him. How have your studies been going? Has Mr. Yang been teaching you well? Uh-huh. I'm up through fractions in math. Iceheart paused, although before we left, he did ask me a real I couldn't figure out. He smiled weakly. Can you please help me, Auntie? Poussons grinned to herself. Yang Chu was a Kieran scholar who had fled the Western continent after he had shown up at the Warlord he served too many times. He had been running his life after having once again sold the rail before his lord when he happened to pass through a port city, 
or one of Poussin's agents, who knew how badly she wanted a couple of Kirin, and perhaps a few Logma to add to her vault. I swear, every single moment she describes this, I get this twins if I just want to wrap my hands around her throat! A ring for him to slip out to sea. She was a brilliant scholar, a master of rails and wordplay. So Poussin's had asked him to handle the education of the fault falls. Oh, that's it, little dear. When you need me, you don't have me. When you have me, you don't need me. Where am I? Poussin thought for a moment. Hmm. Then I suppose I could give you a little hint. Isaac grinned. The answer has to do with money. Money? I start blinked. Will you have m money? You don't need it. Will you need money? You don't have it. I was confused. What does that mean? Poussin looked back at the bottle of wine in front of her. A top shelf brand called Imperial Wine. It thought back to when she purchased it. She had seen eight bottles of it at a prestigious wine shop. Each price at a thousand bits even. But as it happens, he had seen each of them be sold, and knowing how each pony paid a very different price for each bottle. The first bottle went to a scruffy-looking family. A middle-aged couple, an elder stallion, and a younger mare. They entered and hurried to the center of the largest open space in the store, as if terrified of bumping into and damaging other bottles. Wilson's noticed their outfits. They wore formal suits and dresses that had been passed and sewn up many times. The youngest mayor's dress, in particular, looked faded from overuse, and the elder stallion couldn't quite hide that his jacket was missing two buttons. The look at this environment was foreign to them as a distant consonant. But they had come nonetheless, and Poussin's heard, to her great surprise, the father asking for one of the bottles of the imperial wine. Poussin's had gone to talk to them, and after a few moments they yielded to her authority. It was her special talent after all told them their story. They were a lower middle class family called the Bonnets. Merchants and factory workers who did well enough to keep a roof over their heads and food on the table, or perhaps the occasional pit left over for an ice cream cone or toy. They had toiled for years, expecting to remain as they were forever. Until opportunity struck. Zuzerain Bluewood, the baron of a small sub province of Heisigoania, had bumped into the mayor on the street and had been smitten. Now, marriage was a possibility. And a marriage to a noble would elevate the family from a life of toil to a life of comfort. But the marriage wasn't finalized yet, and Suzerain's family was understandably concerned about him marrying a commoner of minimal means. Suzerain had thus invited Bluebell Bonnet to meet his family, a sort of distant from marriage. A gift, of course, was compulsory. Not just any gift, but one that would convince the family that were cultured, and they were refined, and above all, they were dirt poor commoners, so they scrimped, and saved, and sacrificed, and put away money. After all this, in the one month they had before the dinner, they immensely accumulate 1,000 bits. With that, they could buy the finest wine they could afford, and hopefully secure the marriage, which would mean their salvation. But the wine puts on slot as the family was rung up, cost them much more than 1,000 bits. There were the obvious course, bit, cost, of course. The family had pawned a 200-bit chest for 60 bits. They had pawned the jewelry and taken bits for three pieces that Poussins would have valued at 150. They even sold a little of the campground that they used to rent out over the summer, depriving them of hundreds of bits of future income. Then there were little incremental costs. The nights, when they were exhausted from working double shifts, and took a cab home. When they tried to cook with unfamiliar, dirty foods like millet, ruined them and had to buy more. When he put off repairing a wagon until it collapsed and needed to be replaced. Then there was the big one. A fifth member in the family, a quiet, hard-working uncle, had fallen from, uh, ill from overwork. His medicine, his doctors, and even his lost productivity, that was all at big cost. In the end, Poussin estimated that the family had actually spent almost 3,000 bits to get that 1,000 bit of wine. And the next group wore suits and dresses that were crisp and clean. So Chris, Poussin knows, that they would be rented. They moved with more ease to brand the wine, clearly not scared of breaking anything, but they didn't seem to know much about it. So he heard their comments about how this wine or that was too fruity or acidic, almost rolled their eyes at their bluffling babble. 
He had to like a middle class pony's idea of what a Fritz pony would act like, and it showed. When Poussin spoke to him, they admitted they didn't stop there as much as they hoped to imply. A collection of trades ponies. They included a doctor, a lawyer, two engineers, and a consultant. The latter chattered a mile a minute to complain about technical aspects of the wine he tasted, so he had some idea what he was talking about. They explained to Poussin that they were five longtime friends who had all recently achieved some sort of professional success and was to celebrate with a bottle of wine. They had taken an hour or two off from their practices to go wine shopping, they said, because they had no service with which to entrust the task. They had rented suits because they had been one taken seriously. They had hired a carriage because this was the kind of wine store where ponies were riding carriages. Between the suits, the carriage, and the lost productivity, it was on estimate that their bottle of wine cost them 1,500 bits. And, she thought as they left, and then another hundred, because the consultant just annoyed the staff so much with his chatter and condensation, he'll probably get a subcharge if he ever shows up here again. The third bottle went to a suited pony who made no conservation. He simply approached the staff, mentioned that the Countess was expecting company, paid for his purchase, and left without further ado. The fourth, fifth, and sixth bottles went to another suited servant, who said the Archduke's nobility was hosting a party for some top generals. The store included a discount on the bulk purchase, such that she only paid 2,700 bits for three bottles, or 900 per. The seventh was even cheaper. A chef hurried in and complained that his shipment of imperial wine was worth one bottle. Check out the records revealed the truth of this statement, and he took the replacement bottle. When he mentioned the total price he paid in total quantity, once I was calculated that he was only paying about 500 bits per bottle. And then he sold a lot of stuff. I suppose then, it is as rare as he would like to apply. Finally, Poussons had stepped up to the counter and introduced herself. The store's manager hurried up, levitated the last ball in front of him. We would love to become your wine supplier in Castlehot, he simpered. As a token of our appreciation of your many, many qualities and talents, please enjoy this bottle of imperial wine on the house. Poussin's debated telling the story to Iceheart, but decided not to. She so told his scepter, but the foal had derailed things early on with questions about whether or not she helped out the family that was trying to marry the nobility. Yeah, because that would involve charity and niceness, and quite for now, you are top of my list of bitches I want to kill. He had not seemed to understand that the family wasn't from her provinces, so it was not her problem. And evidently, he had to make up some excuse to lead the conversation before she lost her patience. Instead, she just said, I couldn't give you the whole answer, dear. I'm sure if you think about it, you're thinking it out. I'll do my best. Ice Heart's food came, and the foal tucked in. Pusa smiled to herself and sailed back on her cushion, feeling the air shift trembling slightly as it moved through the snowstorm. We stood there for two hours, and beat the elements by the three. There should be enough time to prepare the hotel. If I could sit up before they arrive, I could make sure they don't do anything troublesome, and I tried to take ice out from me. See now to herself, ice out is my knights. He's not yours, and he's not some absent windigos, and he's not Nuna's. He is mine, and I will not lose him to you. We're here, said Trixie, I think. No station was a tiny little platform at the edge of town. A hasty addition to a village that looked like it had been built centuries ago and promptly frozen in time. The train had shrunk to tiny three cars after the last stop, and even then only a few passengers disembarked. Night had almost fallen, but there were very few lights from inside town. The bright lights of Muscot, Stalingrad, and even Omsk seemed cutting its away. Snow was falling at a moderate rate. This is kind of small, Dizzy looked around. I think this town might be smaller than Ponyville. Why are we staying here? Closest to where the Windigo is, said Trixie. I thought, said Raindrops, as he moved into the town itself, that this place was supposed to have a great hotel, the Northern Gate or something. It does, said Charlie. I've been there before. It's huge and really nice. How does a little town like this have enough people for a big hotel? 
as Carrot Top. She only raised her head and adopted the tone of a school teacher. Before the train system was put up, there was no easy way to get to Equestria's northern border. Most of the land in the northern part of Russia was in habitable steppes, snowbound ten months a year. But Polly still wanted to get to Elkheim and Hippogriff Nations for train to diplomacy. So, a road was constructed. Nome was the northernmost city on that road, the last stop before leaving the country. So, every point you wanted to travel north stopped through here, said Ditsy. Here, and all the other south towns here on the way, used to be a lot of inns and small towns to make the journey more comfortable. They were actually relatively well off, Charlie shrugged. When the province and the rail companies eventually got the trains running, the roads became obsolete. Now, you could take a train from Counterheart to Elkheim Capital without ever leaving a worn train car. And you could do that in a fraction of time. So, no point comes here anymore. And a lot of the locals moved out. Two of the hotels, though, are still open. The other gates, the better of the two. And if it's anything like the last time I stayed here, it's actually one of the best hotels you ever stay in. They reached the Sarah Gnome, an open and empty square surrounded by shops by four sides. Most of the shops were closed and dark. Only a bar, a small tire, and a laundry were lit. In the distance, at the far edge of town, Dizzy saw a structure in a fading light. This is creepy, whispered Carrot Top. I don't like this place. Afraid of the dark, said Trixie. It's not dark, it's cold, Trixie Top's hissed up her coat. It'll be really cold. I'm sort of wind to go, is it here already? Dizzy looked around uneasily. From the snowbound houses to the cracked, crumbly streets, the entire town felt like Poise had just given up. Is this what a world overrun by Wendigos will look like? No pony cares about their town or any pony but themselves? It just huddles inside and runs away while things crumble around them? Yeah, feels like Wendigos already run this place. Agent Haymaker said that an agent would meet us if the Wendigo left its current position. No pony did. So it's still five miles away or so. <laughs> Trixie chuckled. Relax. This town always got ponies. Okay, no monsters here. As they walked, the northern gate building slowly came into view. Trixie couldn't help but gulp when she saw it. It was a huge structure covering the entire block, and it had been designed in the Art Deco style. Fully colored, geometric components were combined in symmetrical patterns to make up the building structure. The outer windows were all made of stained glass, and aluminum and steel lines ran out the building in parallel strokes. They terminated at the top of the building, where Dizzy could dimly see a sunburst like her stretching across the wall. This place is hell old? asked Raindrops. Old, said Charlie. Even she seemed somewhat odd. Dizzy understood the feeling. It was an imposing building, tall enough to tower over them, with such angular lines that looked painful to touch. It um, looks better on the inside. Does a pretty Corona's basement? asked Carrot Top. No pony knows, said Trixie. And more importantly, no pony cares. Can we get inside before we freeze to death? Dizzy gave the building one long, easy look. I'm glad Dinky stayed home for this one, she thought. But Trixie was right. They stayed outside, they only get colder. She took a deep breath and followed Trixie in. The interior of the building was nice enough. Dizzy had to admit, the lobby had plenty of cushions and three roaring fireplaces to keep the chill out. She so walked with the other elements towards the reception desk, where a brightly smiled pony greeted them. Hello, said the receptionist. How can I help you? We should have reservations, said Trixie. Where are the nights? Wait. Shirley held up a huff. You don't have a Russian accent. She never realized. I should know. I married a Russian pony once. Are you from around here? Ugh. The recession is plus. Um, no. My name is Paige Center. I work for Fussane Parsons. So why are you checking guests in? Asked Trixie. The vice train didn't want the locals to gossip about I thought. I'm so you're familiar with his condition. And she was concerned they might tease him about it. So she paid for the hotel staff to take a vacation to Palermo for the duration of our stay. She brought her own staff to do the cooking and the cleaning. Pacer smiled brightly. 
Definitely. We're just as hospital as the locals. And Chef makes a delicious kind of stew. She beamed. Shall I show you to your lips? The almost looked at each other. Raindrops frowned. That's strange. Dizzy caught pace her gaze, and also surprised that the mare didn't seem slightly surprised to see her wandering eyes. That was unusual, though Dizzy of course didn't mind it. You think Chinese police do not react to unusual looking strangers? Not really, argued Pacer. The vice rain has impressed upon every pony in her service the importance of respecting even the most unusual appearing of ponies. She does not want to risk offending her word. Tracy raindrops and cheerily exchanged glances. We've had some bad experiences, said raindrops her usual blunt monitor, with nobles when there weren't other ponies around to check them. You sure that every pony in the hospitality industry in here works for her? Pacer frowned. Well, this is other than no tail and gnome. That's as good as this one. But if you really want it, the vice dream has authorized me to set you up over there. Would you like it? Just bit her lip. So he was tempted, she had to admit. The hotel was beyond creepy, and given what the nobles had done to them, she had no desire to live in an environment where she was completely surrounded by the staff and servants of one of the most powerful nobles at all. Barbara just wanted to run away. But the knights were there to protect the foal, and he couldn't do that from across town. Besides, she so promised to give Poussin the benefit of the doubt. Her motives could be well genuine. And she wouldn't challenge her by parenting, but it's just saying she must have malicious motives. It's possible Poussin's only wanted the best for Iceheart, as long as that was possible. Dizzy wasn't going to attack her, and it would be multimentally unjust. And so she said, No, we intend to protect Iceheart and the Vice Ring, right? We had to be near them to do that. Yeah, said Tracy a moment later. We're staying. What if said Pacer. The Vice Ring has asked you to meet her for dinner tonight at 7 in the Southern Ballroom. Tomorrow, you had to meet the Wendigo at 8 a.m. Follow me! And so, she led the elements deeper into the hotel.